My name is Chris. I'm a software engineering manager for the Azure Functions team at Microsoft. And I want to talk to you about uh, stateful programming models uh, in serverless. Um, so just a quick overview of what I want to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about serverless. I assume that folks in the audience kind of know what serverless is. And I want to talk about two kind of programming models uh, that are inherently stateful uh, and how they can kind of be composed with serverless. And those two models are workflows and actors. So what motivates me? I've been at Microsoft for about 13 years now, uh, full time, and working in a lot of kind of enterprise-y and cloud-related areas. So I myself am an engineer. Um, you know, I've had to work on a lot of hard, complicated problems. And one thing that I've learned is that I don't like complexity. Uh, and I assume that most of you folks don't either. I like, as much as I can, you know, uh, developers tend to be my customers. I want to make hard problems easy. I want to make complex things simple uh, so that, you know, myself and so that other developers can be more productive. Uh, and so you'll kind of see that as a theme throughout this talk. Um, so serverless. When I talk about serverless, I'm mostly talking about functions as a service or FAS. Um, you know, talking about kind of elastically scalable, event-driven programming models, um, and you know, generally, you know, kind of low cost, pay for only what you use. Now, just a quick show of hands: Are there any folks in the audience who are using serverless in production today? Oh, nice. That's a good percentage of you. Any of you who are not yet but are planning to move there? Your company's looking into serverless. Okay, nice, nice. Um, yeah, so hopefully this will be really interesting uh, for, for all of you folks in the audience. Um, so anyways, if you've done some research into serverless or looked into it, you may have heard some of these best practices, uh, which some of the thought leaders in the space will often kind of promote. Uh, you know, functions must be stateless. Functions must not call other functions. Functions should do only one thing. Now, I tend to agree with these in principle. But I think, I, I do push back on them a little bit. I think that there are actually ways that you can do stateful serverless in a way that's responsible and still kind of adheres to the, uh, the spirit behind these principles. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, throughout my talk. Uh, so the first kind of stateful programming model that I want to talk about is workflows. So here's an example of a very common workflow pattern. So in, in this diagram, F1, F2, and F3, those are functions. You could think of those even as uh, microservices. I'm using the Azure Functions logo because it's convenient. Um, so in this particular flow, you have some function F1. It produces some output. That output is stored into a queue represented by the cylinder shape here. And that becomes the input of some other function F2, which then does some computation, creates an output that gets fed to F3. So, you know, just kind of a chain of functions. And this is a very common pattern that you see maybe in like order processing, right? You receive an order. You need to go and check your inventory system. You need to go and, you know, remove from your inventory, get the things shipped. There's a lot of kind of sequential steps that need to be taken. Uh, so, you know, you can implement these with kind of classical serverless today, but there are a bunch of problems uh, that you'll probably run into as you start to do this. Uh, one of which is the relationship between your functions or your microservices and uh, these queues, these it's kind of unclear. You know, if you're actually using like a cloud vendor and you're looking at kind of your list of all the functions that you have and the list of all the queues that you have uh, provisioned, you know, you're not going to get like a nice diagram like this typically that shows you what that relationship looks like. Typically, you just have a flat list of all your different resources that you're managing. Uh, so, you know, you don't, you don't have as much clarity on what is it that my application is doing and what are those dependencies looking like. Um, operation context, right? So you're calling these functions in the context of some particular operation, and typically you have to flow some that context through the whole thing. Oftentimes, you may need to rely on yet an external database, you know, which maybe has a record of, you know, well, what is the order that I'm actually processing here? And then, you know, flowing maybe an identifier to that through these, these different functions. Um, middle queues, you know, these are actually kind of an implementation detail, right? You're just trying to pass information from one function or one service to another. And, you know, the, the fact that there is a queue that you have to manage, that's a bit of conceptual overhead. Um, and then if you think about error handling, now obviously queues will give you some degree of error handling, right? If there's a machine failure or something, that message will go back, you know, stay on the queue. 
or when your compute comes back up, you know, it can pull it off of the queue. So you get some sort of resiliency there, but what if you need to do things like compensation? Right? Let's suppose that there was some uh, application level failure within F3 and you need to do some compensating action to undo what you did in F2 and F1. Well, now suddenly you have to add a bunch more queues and then uh, you know, kind of the lines and boxes get a lot more complicated. Um, so there are some uh, solutions that make some of this easier, such as kind of declarative uh, you know, workflow like designers where you kind of drag and drop, you know, here is my business flow, or perhaps even you know, using some sort of XML or JSON markup to describe you know, this is what my user flow is. It solves some of the problems that I mentioned before, and uh, you know, these, are, these are commonly used today, uh, but from my experience and what I've heard from talking with many others is that you know you run into problems of scalability with a lot of these things you know typically business workflows that you're designing uh, you know they're maybe not simple kind of four-step flows uh, you know they tend to have kind of a lot of conditions and you know maybe even some loops and different things and you know especially if you're using like a visual designer that tends to not scale very well. You kind of have to zoom out and there's just a lot of complexity. Even in the case of markup, you know, that, that JSON file could get really nested, really deep, really quickly. Um, and there tends to be a bit of an impedance mismatch. So typically the, the functions or the services uh, themselves that you're orchestrating, you know, those are in code and they're dealing with data, they're generating data, and then you have to somehow marshal that data through this workflow system and kind of declare how you're going to pass it you know, from one, one action to the next. And you know, because you're using some declarative language, there can be a bit of an impedance mismatch. Um, and I would say they're not exactly developer friendly in a lot of cases. You kind of have to learn you know, this new language, so to speak, and you know, developers want to do things like unit test uh, you know, their workflows, not just the individual functions, but even the, the thing that ties them all together. And you can't do that easily with some of these declarative solutions. Uh, so one of the projects that I work on is called Durable Functions, uh, which uh, Colin mentioned. And you know, I want to show you how, with you know, what we've come up with, you can actually do kind of this function chain using code. Uh, so this function that we have here on the screen, this is what I call an orchestrator function. And it basically represents that diagram uh, that you see to the right. Um, you know, we know that this is an orchestrator function. It has this context object, which is passed in as a parameter, which will give you some information about, you know, like kind of what is the ID of this orchestration, what was the instance that kicked it off, things like that. Um, and then, you know, all the different kind of actions that you run in the middle are what we call activity functions. Uh, F1, F2, and F3 in this case. And you know, here, this is in C Sharp, obviously, and we're, we're just using some simple APIs to actually call F1, F2, and F3, get some return values back, and then pass them on to the next step, you know, which feels very natural uh, to a developer. And if you need to do kind of compensating error handling, you can use try-catch um, and those sorts of things like we have here. And it turns out we're able to achieve the exact same behavior in terms of reliability uh, between F1, F2, and F3 that you get if you kind of manually implemented this using stateless functions and queues. And you know, one of the things that I should mention is you know, our use of await here, if you're familiar with async await, uh, you know, we have a trick where whenever you do an await statement, we're actually able to checkpoint your progress within this function so that if it gets unloaded from memory, if it crashes uh, or something like that, let's say you've uh, finished F2 but haven't gone on to F3, uh, you know, as soon as we bring uh, this code back up onto a healthy VM, we're actually able to start where we left off. We don't need to re-execute F1 and F2. We can start directly from F3, just like if you were using normal queues. Um, so this is what I think uh, chaining could look like uh, using code, and this is in fact kind of something that we do. Uh, so just a quick quiz, I mean, you know, maybe it looks a little bit magical, uh, and we're going to kind of talk about how this all works, but it does, you know, I thought maybe I'd ask you guys if you have any thoughts, uh, you know, on how maybe we do this. Anyone think that maybe we're using uh, memory snapshots, right, because we're preserving these local variables, you know, and how is it we're able to kind of get those values back? Any guesses on memory snapshotting? How about compiler hooks? You know, I mentioned what we're doing with the kind of async await stuff there. Uh, event sourcing, 
Okay, a few more hands. A uh, little bit of all of the above. And how about none of the above? <laughs> cool, so the, actually the, the answer is C, event sourcing. Uh, so we're actually not doing any kind of uh, special memory snapshotting or compiler hooks. We're just using event sourcing to kind of uh, create a statefulness in these orchestrator functions that also gives us a degree of reliability. Uh, so we're going to talk about kind of how that works behind the scenes. And so I'll warn you, this slide is a little busy with a bunch of animations. I probably spent way more time on this than I should have, but I wanted to kind of explain to you how we're using event sourcing behind the scenes to actually implement those top three lines of code and make it uh, durable and reliable. So um, in the beginning, you know, assume we have some trigger function which actually starts up this, this workflow. And it's putting a message into a queue behind the scenes. Um, now this queue is managed by us. This is not something that when you write this type of code that you have to manage. You know, we have a framework that actually kind of puts that into, the, into a queue for you that we provision and manage. And then on the right-hand side here, we have an event history, which is basically our event sourcing, kind of the log that we keep of what happened. Uh, so we trigger this, we write execution started. At that point, this orchestrator function sees that, oh, I have a message to start executing. It's going to go ahead and read that. And then you know, I'm highlighting the line of code that we're currently at, kind of like if you're doing interactive debugging. And the first line says, OK, I need to call this activity function called F1. And so behind the scenes, what it's actually going to happen is this function is going to drop a message into another queue. And we're going to write another event history saying, OK, we scheduled F1. Great. At this point, we can actually unload that function from memory, um, either because we want to preserve memory, because this is going to be a long running operation, this F1. Um, you know, or it could even be like a machine crash. For whatever reason, you know, we're able to unload this. And the activity function then can pick up that message. And it can say, oh, OK, I need to execute that. And on the bottom here, I'm saying F1 just returns a number, say 42, for the, the sake of simple illustration. Uh, so it executes that. It gets a return value. It puts that return value back into another control queue, which is going to trigger our orchestrator function on the top again. And you'll notice that we wrote in the event history that the task completed, F1, returned a value of 42. So now the orchestrator picks that up. And because we unloaded it from memory, it has to start its execution from the very beginning. And so once again, we're at that first line and saying, you know, I want to call activity async F1. But this time, we're able to, you know, we have that context. And we're able to look at our event history through that context and see that, oh, look, we already ran F1. It returned a value of 42. So instead of running that again, I'm just going to take that value that I got back and then just return it immediately. So that the, the variable x now contains that value. And we're able to move on to the next step. Now we're calling F2. We have not called F2 yet, so we go through the same process. We write a message into a queue. Or we write down that we've scheduled this. And then you know, we actually execute it. It's going to take n plus 1 in this case, which is uh, now we're up to 43. Send that response back, again, updating our history. And then the orchestrator, once again, starting from the very beginning, is able to kind of walk through the history and say, OK, I did F1, I got 42. Move on to the next line. OK, I called F2, now my response is 43. I can save that into Y. And then once again, next step, haven't called F3 yet. Let's go ahead and go through that process again of scheduling that final F3 message. It's going to execute. We're adding two more. Uh, we're sending the response back, and then the orchestrator can pick that up. Again, find, walk through the history one final time. We can see that you know, we've already called all of these functions before, and we have values for them. And now at this point, you know, we're completed, and we have some final return value of 45. So uh, you know, as you can see, now we've, we've kind of created a, a statefulness here, which is implicit. We're able to rebuild local variable state and you know, kind of walk our way all the way through this orchestration and have a lot of the reliability guarantees that you would expect. And if you're running this in a serverless compute environment like Azure Functions or in a service like Lambda where you're charged based on how long your functions are executing, uh, this is actually really nice because of how aggressively we can actually unload these orchestrator functions so that you're not being double billed, right? Or the orchestrator function is not sitting in memory waiting for the activity function to complete itself. 
so, you know, which is one of the reasons why there is this principle of functions shouldn't call other functions. Uh, double billing is kind of one of them. So anyways, now because we're using event sourcing and we're not doing anything with kind of snapshotting memory or doing compiler tricks, we can actually do this in multiple languages pretty easily. So here's the exact same uh, orchestrator function, which kind of does that function chain, uh, written in JavaScript. In the case of JavaScript, we're actually using generators instead of async await, and the reason we use generators is because it's, it, we have a little bit more control compared to uh, the way that promises work in, in JavaScript. But it's the same basic idea, you know, just replace await with yield, and we can do the same sort of things. Again, just using event sourcing to kind of power all of this. Um, so in order for this to work, right, so we're replaying your function code multiple times to kind of rebuild that state and continue to make process, uh, progress. Um, your orchestrator code must be deterministic. And in order to make it deterministic, we have a few simple rules that need to be followed uh, when uh, you're authoring this code. One of which is you can't have any random numbers or any random date where if you, you know, call some API multiple times, it's going to return different values. So that's things like, you know, if you're creating new GUIDs or UUIDs or getting the current date time um, or just, you know, generating random numbers, you know, you can't do that because that's going to mess up kind of that, uh, that replay logic. Uh, you also can't do I.O. or custom thread scheduling directly in these orchestrator functions because those similarly are non-deterministic, right? That file that you're reading the first time might not exist the next time that you try to read it, and that would mess up the replay. Um, and don't write infinite loops. Uh, you saw that we were kind of creating this history of all the, the steps that we took. Well, if you write an infinite loop, then that history is going to grow unbounded and something is going to fall over. Now, luckily, uh, we have simple workarounds for all three of the above rules. So rule number four is, you know, please use those workarounds. So, for example, if you need the current date time, we have a deterministic API that can be used for that. Uh, similarly, if you need a random, uh, you know, globally unique identifier, there's an API for that. If you need to do I.O., you can do it inside those activity functions, uh, which I described uh, previously. Those can do whatever they want. And because we you know, we'll cache the results of those inside that execution history. Uh, we don't actually have to call those again as part of the replay. We just need to remember what the result of it was the first time that we called it. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's relatively straightforward to actually do static analysis of code to make sure that people are following these rules. And there's a few runtime checks as well. From my experience, uh, this hasn't been a major issue for people who have tried to adopt uh, this mechanism, uh, you know, writing deterministic code. The rules are fairly simple and easy to follow, and you know, you'll find that um, uh, you can be quite successful using techniques like this. Uh, so the the previous example that I showed was was pretty basic, right? Just a simple function chain, and you could do that pretty easily in a lot of different ways. Where things get really interesting is when you want to do things like what I call fan out and fan in. So the idea here is that, you know, let's say you have some function f1, which, you know, goes and fetches a, a set of work items that need to be executed in parallel. And, you know, that, that's represented by multiple instances of f2. Excuse me. And then, so potentially, you know, and here we have three, you could potentially have a thousand executions of F2 that have to run concurrently. And then maybe once they're all done, you have to do some aggregation and call F3 to, to do some final processing of, of all of the work that you just did. Uh, so there, there are problems when you try to implement this using traditional means as well. The first is that, you know, fanning out, that's easy. Right? Any kind of serverless compute can do that, where you just drop a bunch of messages into a queue, you have some function that triggers off of those messages, and you, know, you get parallelization, and that just works great. The problem that you run into is, well, how do you do the fan in? Right? Like, all of those are running kind of in parallel. You don't know exactly when they're going to complete. Um, and some, there needs to be some sort of coordination that happens so that you know as soon as the last one is finished to immediately move on uh, to F3. And typically that requires you to have some sort of stateful agent that's running in the background and monitoring all the work that's done here, which again, you can do that, but it's a lot of work. Um, 
And you know, obviously you have the same problems that I described in function chaining. Now we've just made it even more complicated because we've introduced a lot of parallel, uh, parallelization into the flow as well. Uh, well, it turns out that if you're using event sourcing and kind of creating a programming model on top of that, it's actually relatively trivial to solve. Uh, so in this case, you know, I have a C-sharp function. It calls F1 like I discussed, and it returns an array of items, uh, which could be any arbitrary size. Uh, then we're going to do the fan out part, which is I'm looping through all of those. I'm calling some F2 function. I'm not awaiting them because I want to run these in parallel, so I'm just kind of scheduling them. And if you've ever used Promises or the task parallel library in .NET, then this will look very natural to you. Um, you know, we're not kind of doing anything special here in terms of the programming model. And so anyways, uh, so we schedule all of these and we keep track of all these tasks uh, that we've created, these background tasks, and put them into a list. And then the fan in is simply, we're just doing task out win all. So, you know, please await at this point uh, until all of the, you know, parallel tasks have completed. And once that is completed, we can immediately go to the next step where, you know, we do some sort of an aggregate. Uh, you know, aggregation on the results. And because in that uh, diagram that I showed previously, you know, the orchestrator function is getting signaled whenever something is finished. And so we know immediately when all of those parallel tasks are finished and we can move on to the next step without needing to implement any other kind of monitoring system uh, to keep track of that. And so the problem becomes uh, trivial, trivially simple, even in a distributed environment uh, where you just need to write a function. Uh, so just to, to provide a little bit of context on how some people are using this, uh, Fujifilm, I had a chance to go to Japan and, and work with them a little bit on this new system that they were creating um, for basically Japan's version of, the, of uh, you know, their professional baseball league, uh, NPB. And they basically have a system where you know, there are a bunch of photographers who go to these games and take pictures of the different players and you know, what's going on, and they submit them uh, to this image work system. And you know, there's basically a workflow that needs to run for every one of those, you know, for the different batches of those pictures where they need to do processing, they need to do kind of uh, classification analysis, they need to you know, look at the image to see, okay, who is being depicted here? Uh, so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of kind of work that they need to do uh, to kind of implement this flow of processing pictures. And, you know, one of the interesting outcomes of this was, you know, they had a, an older system that, where they could do maybe 3,000 uh, photos, I think in about four hours is what it was. They actually re-implemented it on top of kind of this, on durable functions, you know, kind of using the stateful event source based programming model. And they were actually able to get this entire workflow down to about 30 minutes, uh, which is a pretty big boost. Now, and I don't credit you know, Azure necessarily for uh, enabling that, but really I think it had a lot to do with the productivity gains that you get when you're able to kind of introduce uh, someone to kind of simple coding constructs that people can understand that take care of a lot of the complexities that your engineering team otherwise has to deal with. So I just wanted to kind of call that out as you know, a, a success story that we're kind of seeing uh, using models like this. Uh, so one other uh, kind of workflow pattern I wanted to highlight, I, I moved to number five, there are actually a few more, but we don't have time for all of them, is uh, human interaction. The, the basic idea is, you know, let's say you have some sort of an order processing system internally with your company. I need to make a purchase order. Uh, let's say if it's over $1,000, it needs some sort of manager approval. And so that manager has to go and click a button and say, yes, I approve this, or no, I do not approve this. Well, it turns out that humans are not as reliable as cloud systems. Uh, sometimes they go on vacation, sometimes they get distracted, and so you need to implement controls for that within your workflow. So, for example, a timeout. Let's say if a manager does not approve this purchase order within three days, uh, you know, we have to go down some escalation path. Maybe we need to go and send an email to the manager's manager or something like that. So this is a common uh, workflow pattern as well. Uh, similar to, uh, I think, uh, multi-factor authentication is another example of this type of workflow where you know, somebody wants to log into a system and you need to send them a code and then they need to enter in that code uh, to, to prove that they are who they say they are and there's a timeout associated with that. Um, so again, the, the problems with implementing this 
you know, there's kind of race conditions between timeouts and, you know, the actual approval that you need to be able to handle. There's, a, you know, how do you do the cancellation of the timeout if, you know, you did get the approval, but then, you know, the, the timer, some sort of background timer expired in the meantime. Again, same problems that you have as before. So we have a code uh, version of solving that as well. Um, let's see, this one's a little bit longer, but it's still conceptually quite simple. You know, where there's an API where you, you can basically create a timer where this orchestration can send a message to itself, uh, you know, at some specified time. Uh, in, this, in this example, we're saying, you know, in 72 hours, uh, representing three days. Uh, there's also an API where you can kind of wait for some external event, right? So these are very much, very stateful types of things where, you know, we're giving the illusion that we're actually suspending the execution of this workflow, waiting for somebody to click a button, which is going to send a message to this function and cause it to resume where it left off. Um, but in both of these cases, we're not actually awaiting the task yet. We're going to this next line and we're saying task.whenany, or, you know, very similar to, I believe it's promise.any if you're using Java or, or similar languages. Uh, you know, where we're actually checking to see, well, which one of these came first, the approval event or the timeout event? And then depending on which one you got first, you can either go into the process approval branch or you can go into the escalate branch. And so again, it's a very simple way to kind of implement this and still get all the durability guarantees that you get uh, with queues. Again, so if something completely fails while you're waiting for these things to happen, uh, you know, your VM can be restarted and you know, you'll still kind of uh, resume where you left off effectively. Um, so there was, so this is what we started with in durable functions. And uh, you know, durable functions, I think we, we GA'd the original version about a year and a half ago, I would say. Um, and it, it worked great for a lot of the scenarios that we described. Um, but there were a few scenarios that, you know, we saw customers trying to implement, kind of these state, stateful serverless patterns, uh, you know, which were kind of awkward to do with these workflow paradigms. Uh, one of them is, you know, what I call the aggregator pattern, where the idea is that, you know, I have something which is maybe, maybe needs to do some sort of counting. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, one customer that we had, basically needed to start a workflow, but only after it received a you know, 10 notifications from some external system. And we didn't have a good way of modeling that. And, uh, you know, so we were thinking about, you know, how could we do that? Now, obviously, if you wanted to do this yourself, you have to think about, okay, if I need to process 10 documents, wait for those to arrive, and then, you know, move on and execute some workflow, kind of, you know, how do I, where do I store the state for that? You know, how do I kind of correlate these events? Like, maybe you're receiving, you know, notifications from a variety of different systems, and they have some information that kind of correlates some, a subset of them together. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you manage all that? How do you kind of synchronize, you know, access to state in general? And so what we decided was that, you know, we need another primitive. And that primitive in our case, uh, you know, was actors. And, uh, you know, what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, partnering with Microsoft Research on this because, you know, we didn't have a lot of experience with actors ourselves. Uh, the Microsoft Research, if you're familiar with the Orleans framework, uh, you know, some of the researchers that we worked with were contributors to Microsoft Orleans, which is an actor system. And uh, so we, we came together and said, you know, hey, how can we kind of expand what we've been doing with durable functions to kind of accomplish some of these other stateful patterns and still make them work in a serverless environment? So actors are really interesting. Uh, so if you ask people, about actors. Some people love them, some people hate them, most people don't know anything about them. At least this is kind of my experience. And of the people that do know them, they have a wide variety of opinions about them. Uh, so my colleague David Fowler, he is an architect um, over for .NET uh, within Microsoft, and he has a lot of followers on Twitter, and uh, he was just curious, kind of on his own, he just asked a simple question, why aren't actor frameworks more popular? And, uh, you know, we're, we're learning that, you know, you know using David you know, is a great way to do market research because he has a lot of followers and uh, we got a lot of responses to this question. Um, so, you know, we got thing, uh, information back like, you know, man, you know, these are so hard to debug. You know, why did my state change, you know, or why did something happen or not happen? 
a um, lot of different opinions like that. Um, you know, this, this reply from Roger, you know, cloud native tools one, you know, there's kind of other ways to accomplish all of these stateful problems. Uh, and, and, you know, this, the second thing that he mentioned here, the zero exit strategy out of actor frameworks, which I thought was really interesting, especially coming from him because he's actually uh, the, the author of ACA.net, as I understand, as well as another actor framework. Um, so, so I guess he would know. Um, and, you know, another common response is that, you know, People just want to use CRUD. You know, they don't want to kind of use these, these actor you know, programming models. They're just taught, you know, I create a, a web app, it talks to a database, you know, we'll deal with concurrency and all those things kind of at the database level. Um, and then kind of one of my favorite responses was by Jason, uh, which I actually found out that Jason, I think, is here at the conference somewhere. <laughs> there you are. I hope you don't mind me posting this. Um, but he said, hey, you know, we don't have a way to like right click and publish this, right? We need like a managed version of this, um, you know, which to me it's like, yeah, that's, that's what serverless is all about. You know, I love that. That's, that's exactly what we would want to do. Uh, because, you know, with a lot of actor frameworks today, you know, you have to kind of deploy a cluster and manage that cluster and manage the health of that thing. And it just, it's, it's a lot of upfront investment that you would have to do. It'd be really nice if you could have kind of a serverless version of that. Um, and then, you know, some nice person happened to know about the work that we were doing on, uh, you know, durable functions. And we, we actually created something called durable entities, which is effectively an implementation of the actor model uh, in the context of durable functions. Um, so again, just kind of revisiting where we came from with durable functions, we started out with a few different function types. There's kind of regular stateless functions. You have your orchestrator functions, which are kind of stateful. And you know, those, those compose a bunch of activity functions, which are the different steps within your workflows. And then, you know, what we decided we want to do is, you know, we don't want to invent, you know, yet another actor framework. We wanted to actually take the capabilities of actors and these, these stateful patterns and just kind of fold them into the family here, not kind of make them into their own uh, separate silo. And uh, so we actually have a couple of uh, different syntaxes that we came up for doing this. And again, this is, this is all on top of the Azure Functions uh, programming model. Uh, so if you've ever used Azure Functions, or even, even Lambda, my understanding is it's pretty similar the way that you just can declare a function. Um, but yeah, you just write a function. This function gets invoked whenever a message gets sent to your actor or your entity, as we call it. And it has an operation name. You can write a switch statement and say, you know, yeah, if this is add, I want to get the input and then, you know, update my state with the current value plus some amount. Or, you know, again, reset, set the current state to zero. Or, you know, maybe I want to return a value back to somebody else uh, if, they, if they do a get. So this is kind of the function syntax that we've done. Um, we tried this in our initial alpha and we got a lot of feedback that, you know, hey, this is really cool, this is great because I can do this in a serverless environment, that's wonderful, uh, but it becomes a little bit weird if I have a lot of different operations that I wanna uh, be able to implement. You know, it'd be great if we had kind of a simpler way of, you know, not having these giant switch statements. Uh, so another thing that we did uh, for C Sharp and kind of a subsequent uh, beta release was we made it so that you could have kind of this, this class-based syntax. Now again, this is still running on top of the Azure Functions programming model, so we have kind of this boilerplate code that runs on the bottom here. Um, but the idea is that you just write a method that corresponds to uh, you know, those different operations. So add, reset, and get in this very simple example here. And you just have some field that lives on your class and you can decorate it with some serialization attributes that says you know, this is my state that I care about. And your code just needs to op update that state. You know, we take care of the, the serialization behind the scenes for you. Um, and this, this follows all the rules that you would expect of actors around like, you know, only processing one message at a time so that you don't have to worry about concurrency issues, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so again, just to kind of give you a, a diagram of what this looks like, you know, even these, these entities, you know, these actors, they're really represented just as a function. 
And that's what makes it easy for us to kind of put this model on top of a, you know, a stateless, serverless compute platform is because you can still author everything as a function. And behind the scenes, you know, we'll take care of figuring out you know, where the actual state lives. Um, the invocation you know, will contain some, I, some ID that says, you know, well, what instance of my entity is this that I'm talking about? What is the, the operation that we're doing? And then we can just feed that information to the function. And behind the scenes, you know, I have this entity class. In the previous example, I showed you a counter. Um, and you can have multiple instances of, the, of those, just like you would in a normal actor programming model. Uh, you know, where there's different keys for the different instances and they can all have kind of their own state and so on and so forth. Um, so why don't we uh, jump into a quick demo because I thought that might help make this a little bit more real if I could show you exactly what's going on here. Um, so I'm going to jump into Visual Studio Code real quick. And the first thing I want to show you is kind of, uh, you know, a real example of this uh, this function chaining, kind of going back into workflows a little bit. So I basically doing the same thing that I showed before, where I just create this list. <clears throat> I'm calling a bunch of activity functions, in this case, uh, say hello uh, to different cities, uh, doing it in a sequence, and then adding the results, and then kind of returning them at the very end. And again, because this is, uh, this is durable, every time you do an await, we're actually going to checkpoint our progress uh, behind the scenes, in, this, in our case, into Azure table storage. Um, and then the say hello function, you know, this is a function that could theoretically do anything. It could make HTTP calls. It could do whatever it wants. Um, and you know, it's going to process whatever input that it got, in this case, a name. And it's going to just return a string that says hello uh, to whatever that is. And so this is just a function. Um, and then in this case, you know, we're using Azure Functions, so I can uh, do a func.start to actually start executing this thing, and it's going to run the Azure Functions host locally. Um, this is the same host that, that we use in Azure, um, or if you're running in Kubernetes or wherever, uh, we use the same, the same host. And so anyway, so that thing has started up, um, so we can immediately start interacting with this workflow. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to uh, this... Um, so one of the things that I have is I have a, a trigger. I have another function, which is just an HTTP trigger function, which will go ahead and start a new instance of that orchestration every time you call it. Um, and I have kind of a convention that I'm using here where I say uh, the name of the, the workflow that I want to run. I'm using HTTP uh, to do this. If you've ever used that tool, it's awesome for dealing with HTTP APIs. Um, so I can send a post message. Uh, it's going to run a little bit slow because I'm using the local Azure storage emulator right now. And you can see it did a whole bunch of work, and I got some response back, uh, some 202 accepted response. Um, and so one of the cool things is because we know that this is a workflow, we can actually give you uh, some sort of management experience on top of that, uh, one of which is you know, we have this location header which is a, uh, something that you can visit to go get more information about, well, what is the current status of that uh, workflow instance that you just started. And so if I do an HTTP GET on that, and hopefully you guys can see this OK, um, you know, I'm able to see like what was the created time of this particular instance, uh, you know, what is the actual function name, and this it says hello chain, and, I, and because this actually completed so quickly, you know, I can see that it's in a completed state and it has an output of, you know, hello Tokyo, Seattle, and London. Um, and because we're using event sourcing, you know, it's even possible to do things like I want to show history equals true. And, you know, behind the scenes, we actually have all of the history of all the different functions that you ran. And so we can actually list all of those things, too, uh, which kind of gives you a nice uh, management experience if you want to go back and kind of see, well, what, what step actually failed? How far did I actually get? Um, and as I mentioned, behind the scenes, what we're doing here is we're actually storing everything in... Uh, Azure storage in this particular case. And um, so I'll open up the tables here. So we have two tables that are, that are interesting. One of them is what we call an instances table. And if you think in terms of like uh, CQRS patterns, you know, this is kind of the read uh, projection of all your stateful functions. So you know, I have my hello chain that I just ran here. I have the output. I see it's in a completed status. So that's kind of the summary view. And then if I go down, we have a history table here as well, 
where you can actually go and you can see, and I think I might even have an old, I might have an old instance in here. Oh, no, I don't. Uh, you can actually see kind of all the different uh, rows, kind of like in that, uh, that previous animated uh, diagrams that I was showing everyone. You can see what are all the steps that we took and you know, what all the different function names were, what were the outputs, uh, so on and so forth. Hello, London. Hello, Seattle. Um, you know, so that's all stored behind the scenes within this table. And, and again, the nice thing is the programming model that's being exposed to you doesn't know anything about this, right? That's just an implementation detail behind the scenes. You're just writing code that uses async await or yield in the case of JavaScript. Um, and you know, we kind of take care of all of the state behind the scenes using event sourcing to make it durable and uh, potentially even long running. Uh, so similar demo that I'd like to show you guys, uh, which is the counter. And in this one, I'm gonna do something, oops, I'm gonna copy a URL here. So here's, here's the same uh, counter uh, example which I showed in my slides. And I'm going to go back uh, to my HTTP tool, and I'm going to do a post. And um, actually, one thing I should do before that is uh, do a get, and then you know I have to come up with some some name of a counter. Maybe we could do QCon SF, you know, 2019. I do a get on that, and you know that doesn't exist, right? We've never created anything with that name before. Um, what I can do instead is I can send a post to that and I can say the operation I want to call is that add operation and I want to send some data to it and you know with this tool I can just use the echo command to do that and then pipe that to HTTP pi. And so I'm saying I want to add 10 to this durable entity called QCon SF 2019. We get back at 202 accepted and then if I go back and then try to query that again what I should see now is that instead of getting a 404 back, I get a 200 back, and it actually shows me, hey, I have a value of 10. And similarly, I can uh, do the same thing a second time. We'll add uh, 10 more to it. And then if I do a get on that again, I should be able to see that, in fact, now the value is 20. So you get, so again, you get kind of this, this actor-like programming model um, you know, which can run in a serverless environment and behind the scenes it's storing everything in, the, in the, the table storage. And so again, if I go back to this instances table, I can see now I also have a new row for that, that entity that I created, uh, which has the name, you know, counter and QCon SF 2019. And so as I create more and more of these entity instances, you know, we'll just see more and more rows behind the scenes. Uh, so anyway, so popping back to the presentation, um, so if you're familiar with actors, there are certain similarities uh, with actors um, that we have with durable entities. You know, one is that these are addressable by some entity ID. Um, you know, the operations execute serially, one at a time. So the same benefits that most people use actor systems for, uh, we, use, uh, we continue to honor those. They're created implicitly, as I showed uh, in my demo. And uh, you know, when they're not executing operations, they can be silently unloaded from memory, which kind of gives you a nice uh, high density. Um, there, are some there are several differences uh, from other virtual actor frameworks too, which are important. And one of the reasons why we didn't call these actors, uh, part of which is just the political, you know, people get really fired up when you call something actors and it doesn't quite fit their model. Uh, but for one, it's, it's totally serverless, uh, which you know, most actor frameworks are not. Uh, the other is that we, pr we prioritize durability over latency. Uh, so uh, a lot of people use actors for you know, super low latency, uh, you know, high performance types of things. We think actually that durability is a slightly more important property, especially when you want to introduce something like this to a broader audience. Um, to remove a, you know, a set of problems that people normally run into with actors. Um, so reliable, we do in-order messaging, uh, you know, messaging timeouts, uh, you know, deadlocks. It's, this is implemented in such a way that deadlocks are not possible, which if you're using something like Orleans or service fabric actors, those are some problems that people run into and one of the pain points, which we're trying to very much avoid those to kind of make people 
you know, as productive as possible without all the, the frustrations. And we also support integration with orchestrations, so, which is really interesting. So again, you know, this is not just actors kind of in a silo. It's integrated with some of the other uh, parts of Azure Functions and even durable functions where you can do some really interesting things. Like for example, let's say I have a system that matches uh, players for an online game. You know, we have the ability within a workflow to say, hey, I want to lock these entities, this player one and this player two. And you know, while it's locked, you know, it won't, those won't process any other operations. And so what I can do then in my workflow is I can you know, check the status of those entities. You know, are they available? If they are, I can assign them to a new game instance. Uh, you know, so you can do some really interesting distributed locking types of techniques when you combine uh, these actors with uh, you know, first class workflow. Uh, so, you know, these are some really interesting areas where we think uh, you can get some very interesting innovation. Again, working completely on serverless platforms. Um, so there's a bunch of other applications uh, which might be interesting. Uh, we're going to share out the slides. Uh, and, you know, you guys can check out some of these. Uh, you know, some patterns like distributed circuit breakers are some things that uh, Poly is a, is a company that kind of builds a lot of distributed system software. And, you know, they announced that they want to use this uh, for a distributed circuit breaker, kind of IoT, API cache, some sort of ride sharing. Um, a lot of interesting examples which might be worth checking out. But you know, pay attention to this space. I mean, again, you know, serverless doesn't have to be stateless. And I think a lot of uh, companies are starting to realize this, that there are ways that you can actually incorporate state uh, you know, into your functions or into your workflows. And so there are a lot of companies uh, that are currently doing some work related to this. So I encourage you all to kind of, you know, check your assumptions about serverless and, you know, take a look into what some of these companies are doing. Uh, so anyways, if you want more information, uh, you know, we have some documentation on durable functions specifically where you can kind of learn more of what we're doing behind the scenes. Everything is open source, so the full source code is available if you're curious kind of how we implemented the event sourcing patterns and things like that. Um, you can find me on Twitter, so feel free to reach out as well. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>